to the cloud. And oh, so we are recording. And let me share with you. Okay, today we are talking, continuing to talk about the origins of Rus. Um, we started out talking a bit about the land and their people, and I ended off last time talking about that um, forest steppe dynamic. Um, here I'll just begin by sharing with you this picture, um, which is, this is called Three Bagatiri. And it is a very famous picture painted in the end of the 19th century by Vaznetsov, um, a Russian artist in, from this period we call the Romantic Silver Age. It was a period of, of rising nationalism and pride in Russianness. And so the, um, it's the subject of many dramatic um, paintings. So this is that painting um, uh, from an age of when Russian patriotism runs very strong and this painting is very romanticized. And what it shows you is two mythic or legendary figures from the court of Vladimir I. Vladimir I rules from 958 to 1015. And he goes down in history as Vladimir the Great. And he is most famous for converting the Slav his, his Kievan people, his Rus subjects to Christianity. And this painting, um, supposedly placed in that era, shows three different Russian princes. Dobrina Nikitinich, who was the prince of Raizan and represented for Vaznensov courage. It shows Ilya Muramets, who was the prince of Murom, and he, re he represents physical and spiritual power and integrity. And on the right, the smallest was the Alyosha Popovich from Rostov. Um, who is sort of this, this different and maybe somewhat ambiguous character. But these soldiers are looking out over the steppe with this, I, looking out in the direction of the steppe. And the, the idea being that are there, are there marauding invaders that might come and capture our Russian people, which I, as I talked about last year, was a real dynamic of um, that raiding, slave trading, nomadic culture that, um, preyed on peasant villages that were at that edge of the steppe frontier. And so this is um, a painting that sort of captures that dynamic as well as capturing a sort of pride in Russian nationalism. And I wanna show it to you as well because that dynamic entailed certain concerns. Like what does a state care about? What does a state do with its resources? And so that, um, that providing security is one of the things that maybe the that that early Russian state did at some level seek to characterize. Now, putting it that way um, is absolutely open to challenge, and that's one of the kind of questions I want you to be thinking about as we go on. But at any rate, I figured I would show you this painting to kind of um, both put it um, reinforce that idea of the steppe forest. Uh, geography and biomes and what that what consequences um, followed from that in terms of thinking about Russian history and statehood and then showing you this painting of a moment when statehood is is developing. Okay, so the next um, and the next thing last time I talked to you about various neighbors and we started to touch on the diversity of this land, these lands that became the Russian Empire. Um, that we had steppe peoples, the Hazars, the Bulgars, Turkics. Um, well, um, there's a bunch of indigenous peoples, the Samoyed, Tungus, Vogel, Chuvash, Mordvin, Komi, Buryat, Koryak, Kamcharals, Chukchi, we could go on Saha, Yakutia, Finno Ugrips, Komi. There's so, I, um, so many different people. Um, so that's part of the mix. We haven't even started talking yet about Slavs or the Norse and um, the Norse ancestors of the Rurikid dynasty or the Mongol heritage. So those are all some of the people that are going to be coming into our mix. And now 
just really quickly, uh, I'll say a few words about Slavs. So who are Slavs? What are Slavs? Well, Slavs are um, identified in, in history as kind of a people that, um, a people of the forest that lived largely by um, both hunting and gathering and a little bit of um, agriculture, but slash and burn agriculture. Um, and there, from the from the fifth century, uh, historic ancient historians tell us we start to see migrations westward, and that maybe these migrations westward occurred as a as a result of major movements farther to their east of of Huns and and the like. Although there's a lot of interesting research on what even Hun means in time, that maybe it was a kind of identity of pride more than one particular people led by Attila that came and also gave the Romans a run for their money. Um, but at any rate, so Slavs kind of come into history in the around the fifth-ish century, um, being very vague here. But the way of in the Eastern Eastern European forests that will become the lands of Russia, the way they live is they've adapted to living with colder um, colder weather, short summers, so they can grow some food, but not that much. And that it means that they also rely on things like gathering honey and hunting various prey birds, fishing quite a bit, and and get food in a variety of ways that aren't just from farming. But to the extent that they farmed, it was very subsistence and they relied on a, a method of slash and burn. And by slash and burn, what that meant is that they would pretty much go into an area and it's mostly colder Northern forests um, and they would burn down the area and that burning would provide tremendous nutrients, the carbon that would go into the soil and then they would mix it out and do this painstaking work of taking trunks out um, or just planting seeds around them. They don't really have super developed plows. Um, and so that burned forest area would provide nutrients to the soil, but for a while that would also get depleted. And so we don't exactly know because where it's just, um, um, you know where you're not having stone cutting so much and not a lot of metal tools everything disintegrates the um it's it's less clear but historians think that maybe anywhere from a dozen to 20 years people might have farmed a particular area and then might have um the soil from where they burned was so depleted that they would move on and, and build other homes so we sort of have this um you know by no means nomadic if you're in a place for a decade that's kind of permanent but still a lot of movement and so we have sort of have this sense that this is how much of the Slav, Slavic um, economy functioned. Um, up in Northern places, we know they used dogs going back for centuries, even humans start domesticating dogs in the Mesozoic, even prior to the Neolithic revolution. Um, they use skis and sleds. Traveling in the winter, it turns out, is a better time to travel despite it being cold than in a time that's muddy um, where Rivers are, you know, river travel happened, but in the spring they're raging too much. In the late summer, they're not deep enough for your boat's gonna bottom out. Um, but that, but snow and ice could, not always, because ice could be uneven, but could provide a real low friction, even surface over which much travel happened with sleds and with skis. This is um this is a picture from Herberstein. Um, from the 16th century, bringing back a picture of how people lived in Russia. And we see someone with this one ski with a long pole, some a horse carrying a sled. Here is another one um, which shows someone, an early version of ski during having your dog on skis. This is a sport I have tried with my late dog. Um, and I, I'll show you other pictures where some people would set up a sail um, on their sled and, and in windy times, maybe travel that way. Here is a picture from of a sled from a museum that I visited, and um, and I'll show you I'll show you this picture of the work on the front. And here I'm going to repeat um, something that my uh, my professor Lev Losev told me when I took a Russian culture class as an undergrad. Lev Losev was a dissident poet who came to America in the 1970s and got found himself a teaching job. And one of the things that he said was that he made a cultural argument. Now I. I have to repeat him because I'm I'm uncomfortable with 
cultural generalizations, they tend not to be very historical. And I worry that sometimes they do more harm than good, particularly that cultural generalization that Russians like an autocrat to rule over them. I really don't have um, too much use for that generalization. I think it's an example of a generalization that's done more harm than good. But I'm going to share with you a generalization that Lev Losev shared with us. And that was that Russians had a, a kind of maximalist personality. And that that was, and now this is a trope of the Russian Revolution that, you know, why do these people go in for this crazy, crazy revolution? I mean, I don't, I don't want to go into it too much, but that, but there is in Russian intellectual history, this idea that it would, there was a maximalist personality. Like we won't just have some freedom, we will have anarchy. Thank you, Pyotr Kapotkin. And, and Lev Losev, he co conveyed to us at least this idea of a kind of maximalist Russian personality. And he said, he attributed it to the climate. And he said that if you are trying to live in a place that is cold and um, so many of the years, are cold and the summer is short and fierce and the days are intensely long, that this led to a lifestyle where if you wanna live, you work hard in the summers. So the summertime was that go, 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 nonstop, make hay. And you would have to do all this work to get your food up so you could live through the winter. But if you did that, then the winter was actually a quite pleasant time where you hold up in your cozy, warm house that you've provisioned for well in the time you had of those long days of, of the short summer and that Russians then would spend their time doing crafts like this and carving. So you see on this sled, you know, you don't need that design to live necessarily, but it is a, it's a nice feature. And Lev Losef decided to um, kind of would point to that sort of craft as skills that were, um, you know, um, not entirely essentials, but the type of work that um, on, and woodcraft that Russians would engage in in the long winters. And so I've sort of mixed there talking a little bit about Russian woodcraft and also the, the, these whole uh, theories of maybe Russian maximalism driven from the, the short, um, short long, long day summers that were that required intense work in order to feed oneself through the winter. Um, okay, so that's a few words about these Slavs that live in this region. And this now when I say this region, I'm starting to talk about the, um, it's sometimes referred to as the Pontic Steppe. This map, which is from um, Zenon Kahoot's book, kind of shows a, a Kievan Rus. And what we see here, here's the Baltic Sea. We see all these river systems. No one river goes all the way through. But there's systems of rivers that people worked out portages that came all the way down here to the Black Sea. And then just across the Black Sea was Constantinople, one of the richest, most vibrant cities. And in the 800s, Vikings make their way into this part of the world and they st and, and start going through on these trade routes. Here's a map of, of sort of Europe and then the Near East, and it shows um, various ways that the Vikings would go down on that purple land through the lands of Kiev. This is where the area we're going to be honing in. They'd also come um, out here all the way to the Volga Bulgars and come down the Volga through the Caspian trade across the ca Caucasus and then into here. Again, you're on the Anatolian um, Peninsula and really from ancient times, a vibrant trading, kind of the Western terminus of the Silk Roads. Um, and so there's much, there's much wealth and splendor to be gotten from Isfahan and Constantinople and the Vikings who were just, you know, everywhere in the early medieval period are going there, not just to this part of the world. Some go to, they go to Vinland on the coast of, you know, near Nova Scotia, right, in the year um, 1000, they come down, um, go inland through Europe and raid, they come down to, and the Normans on Sicily are of Viking descent, and other Vikings, um, Ros, um, which may derive from the word people who row, come through uh, the Baltics and come into these lands. Depending on where they land, Vikings, they had 
fast maneuverable boats. They were able attackers and they tended to operate on kind of attack and retreat, attack and retreat. But as they got farther and farther away in a place like um, the Pontic, Pontic steppes of the, between the Dnieper and the Volga, it was harder to just go home and they started to stay. And so, um, and that is kind of what led to these people of Scandinavian Viking descent coming and settling into these lands. Okay, so I've said a little bit about Slavs and I've said a little bit about Vikings. Before I move to the history of the primary chronicle, and I might not get there today, so perhaps what I'll just do is end up with this one with talk, saying a few words about the early history of Christianity. Um, that is the Moravian mission. And then we'll leave it at that. And in our next lecture, come back and really start talking about this history of the primary chronicle, what is in it. And so the, um, so kind of as a little bit of background before we talk about the Christianization of Rus, let's just talk about the Christianization of this part of the world. As many of you, if you've taken Western Civ, you are familiar um, with the, um, I think Chantel said, you know, if you've taken Western Civ with Chantel, one of the main things you talk about there is the coming of Christianity into Western European history. And it begins in the Roman Empire and it spreads and it spreads tremendously. But what I want for your purposes to point out is that quite early on in, um, in the early periods of the church fathers, you know, Jerome, Augustine, some Christians move east and they move eastward and then they move up into the area of the Caucasus Mountains. And they go into what is now the land of Georgia. Georgia, a small country in the Caucasus Mountains that very sadly was in the news in 2008 when it went to war over enclaves of accession territory that were both in Georgia and in, in Russia. Um, but Georgia is this country in the Caucasus, mostly surrounded by lands that became um, Muslim, whether Sunni or Shiite, and there was both um, in that mix that, were, that adopted Christianity very early. Being in the mountains and quite typical for mountains, it adopted a very, um, it didn't have as much contact with Rome and the rest of the Western world and didn't keep in step with how Latin Christianity developed. And so people that um, have studied Georgian Christianity have found that it's Christianity, but it isn't, it isn't the Latin Christianity. It isn't Orthodox Christianity. It's, it's got some particularities of its own born from its long relative isolation. Similarly, the Georgian script is, um, and here's, here's some pictures of it, is quite unlike um, other, even the script itself. I don't know Georgian. I just enjoy looking at it um, on the, you know, bottles of Georgian wine that I would buy in, in Moscow. But it's um, the Georgian language. It's neither Indo-European. It's not Turkic. It's not Semitic. Um, it's this unique language, kind of like, um, you know, Finnish, Basque, and Georgian, I, I think, I'm, I'm not, no linguist, but are these languages that are kind of isolated pockets amongst um, other languages that kind of bear their own families. Now, so that I just wanted to share a little bit about Georgian and here in our final minutes, let me talk to you a little bit about the Moravian mission. You've just read a bit about the Moravian mission in this quixotic paragraph. Um, but so the Moravian mission, what is it? Now the conversion of to Christianity is a long process. It happens from you know the time when Jesus is well. There's not too much conversion um, when when Jesus is around, except for his immediate disciples. But when in his wake, people like Paul are are they are pushing this religion. They are traveling. They are spreading it. And once it becomes adopted as the official Roman religion, then then it really travels. And you have. Pope Gregory sending missions all over Europe. It takes a long time. Um, even into the 14th century is when the last um, kind of Lithuanian Gediman dynasty that are still pagans up there near the Baltic territories will finally convert to Christianity. Um, so it's a long process. And in this process, one of the things that's going on is with the fall of Rome, Rome kind of splits where Rome declines, which is the seat of Christianity, 
And then Constantinople emerges as a capital of the Eastern, uh, the Eastern Roman Empire. Over the centuries, despite councils and real efforts to keep Christianity unified, there's a lot of divergences between how these faiths operate, such that you end up having Latin Christianity and Orthodox Christianity. Although that split, to be, to be clear and pay attention because of the dates of this conversion and chronicle, um, that split happens officially in 1054. Of course, they've had tiffs before, and in 1054, everyone thinks that they'll bring things back together. We even have a Council of Florence in 1439 that comes up with a plan for how to do that. Never happens or hasn't happened yet. But it, so we have this splitting. Now, as places are converting, in Eastern and Central Europe, some rulers sort of have this thinking like, do I go west or do I go east? Because um, the power that goes with politics and religion, the power that goes with religion, many politicians find useful for their purposes. And so we see some real fellow traveling to put it super simply. And we have from somewhere in um, Eastern Europe in M Moravia or even just slightly west, you don't need to know about him, but Rastislav is one ruler who sees that to the west of him, he's got the descendants of Charlemagne and they've gone with Latin Christian, Latin Christianity, and they want him to convert. And he is thinking, well, if I convert, I'm sort of gonna be under their thumb. They're gonna send me bishops. They're gonna send me church books. I'm gonna be subordinate to them. I don't wanna be subordinate to them. I wanna be my, do my own deal. And he says, but looks like this Christianity thing is pretty effective for unifying people. So why don't I be Christianity, but I'm gonna do a runaround on these Autonians that think I'm gonna be their guy or, um, or Charlemagne, Charlemagne's sons. And so he sends messengers to Constantinople and say, hey, I wanna take up Christianity, can you convert me? Because he understands that then it'll be a way of reaping the benefits of Christianity, but not being under the thumb of the Latin Christian rivals to his West. And so, Constantinople gets the memo and they're like, great, awesome. And they send these guys, Cyril and Methodius to go convert them. As I said, Cyril and Methodius are two monks. And in the 1860s, they go to these Mor Moravian lands in Eastern Europe and their mission has tremendous effects. They get there to convert and they realize these people we can't share with, they can't read scripture because they don't have a written language. And so they stay there, they learn the language, and then they invent an alphabet for them. And here is a version of kind of the al alphabet that they invented. They don't immediately invent um, Cyrillic. They actually even invent something that's like pre-Glagolithic and then it evolves over the centuries to ultimately come become Cyrillic. They use some Greek terms, even me reading the 17th century documents in archives, I'll come to, sometimes come across an omega from the Greek alphabet instead of an O. Um, but so they invent this language. By the way, we only have a few minutes, so I'm gonna be really fast here. By the way, take note that the Latin church um, amidst this history, the Roman Latin church starts to be of the opinion that the scripture is too sacred to be tainted by translation. And so people should learn Latin, which as you all know, is not the language in which the scriptures were originally lit written. It was written in maybe a Koine Greek and Aramaic um, and then translated into Latin later, but they decided Latin, that's what we'll stay with. And the, and the Pope, the papacy was very uncomfortable with translating languages into other people's, like that, that something of the sacred word might get lost. The Eastern Church took a very different approach. They thought their approach was what better way to really reach people's souls in a meaningful way than in their own language. So for them, the project became rather than having learned people to uh, um, know Latin and do the sacraments. And, and the Roman church, by the way, too, wasn't all that into people reading the Bible for themselves. That document is, that book is a wacky. It's really hard to understand. Um, better to not let them, you know, think the wrong things. Unlike, say, Islam, where people should read the Quran themselves and know how to read it for that reason. So the Orthodox world, maybe something in between that, 
thought that people should be preached to in their own language and that the scriptures should be in those particular languages. And so that was a driver behind um, what Cyril and Methodius were up to in this Moravian, Moravian mission, inventing a language with which to copy the scriptures, um, with which to convert Slavs to Christianity. Um, I'm gonna stop there. Um, and so we've talked a little bit about Scandinavia, Vikings coming, Slavs already being there, and this project of Christianization. And in our next lecture, we'll start to talk about the primary chronicle. All right, thank you for your attention. I'm gonna...